It all began one night in November of 1997, backstage at a Birmingham, England arena. Radiohead had released their third studio album, OK Computer, five months prior, and according to conventional wisdom in the music industry, they were on the cusp of becoming the next U2. They were already rock stars, but not that famous yet. Expectations were high, and critical and commercial success were in their grasp. It was time for sound check before their show that night, when out of the blue, lead singer Tom York disappeared. Without telling anyone, Tom panicked. He needed to leave. He needed to escape, and he couldn't explain it. After fruitlessly searching for the exit door, he finally makes it out of the arena and onto the street. He sees a train nearby and decides to hop on board. Maybe disappearing completely won't be so hard after all. But in Tom's fervor, he forgot to think out his plan and soon realizes he's surrounded by Radiohead fans going to the concert he's supposed to perform at in a matter of hours. All Tom can do is slouch down and hide as the train whisks him back to the place he just tried to escape, a metaphor for the closed loop of fame he currently feels trapped in. Tom guts out the show, and by all accounts, it's a success. Radiohead ends their performance with a six-song encore, whipping thousands of worshipping fans into a frenzy. They should feel triumphant, but as the band walks back to their dressing room together, something in Tom snaps. He can't speak. His bandmates, all friends long before he was, quote, MTV famous, ask if he's all right. Tom can tell they're speaking to him, but he can't hear what they're saying or respond. It's his second mental breakdown of the night, but this one much more severe. It all sounds melodramatic and a ridiculous reaction to money and fame and someone on top of the rock and roll heap. But there was an internal battle going on in Tom's head he couldn't escape. Consider how some have reacted in similar circumstances. Rock conspiracy theorists believe Bob Dylan intentionally crashed his motorcycle to escape the contentious touring on the Blonde on Blonde era of 1966. He had just reinvented himself by going electric, moving away from his folk singer-songwriter past. Kurt Cobain actually tried to kill himself amidst a miserable European tour in 1994 before finally finishing the awful deed that spring. Why was Tom in a depression? Well, he felt trapped by expectations thrust upon Radiohead. After their song Creep became a hit in 1993, they followed the much-traveled route of late-night talk shows, British award programs, and MTV beach houses to maintain the little success they had found. And it worked. They slowly started gaining more momentum amid a relentless touring schedule for much of the 90s. But were they anything more than an afterthought amid a generation of Brit-pop shooting stars? It's that question that ate at Tom. He had found success, and it still left him empty inside. In 1997, Radiohead was still playing the game, and it was working from the outside, but Tom knew they needed a change of direction. A reinvention of sorts. But reinventing to what? Radiohead would grind out a few more months on the road. Tom didn't crash his motorcycle or shoot himself, but he felt spiritually and creatively spent. He decided that guitar-based music was dead and that Radiohead was out of step, fresh from putting out an album that supposedly saved rock. He finds the coolness and mechanical style of electronic music makes him feel alive again, the same way guitars once made him feel. He's sick of melody and is obsessed with rhythm, and he finds instrumental music with no vocals inspiring. Now that his old songs have become their own genre of British rock, Tom finds that he can't write Radiohead songs that he likes anymore. He can't even pick up a guitar without feeling like he's dying inside. Over a series of months, Radiohead would reconvene multiple times in hopes of finding something to be inspired by, but they hate everything they record. There's even talk of disbanding if they can't find a way out of the mania. They needed something to be excited about. Tom retreated to his home in Cornwall, England, where with a newly installed Yamaha Grand Piano, a routine of walks along the coastal cliffs and sketches in his notebook, Tom gradually rediscovers his muse. He decides to write about the mental breakdown he suffered the year prior. Well, at least it's the inspiration. Because he didn't want a trail of breadcrumbs for the media to trace back to his personal life, he mostly left the lyrics jumbled and disjointed. He shows the piano ballad to his producer, who isn't overly enamored with it, but the producer has a new toy at the studio he's playing with, a Prophet 5 synthesizer. He says what the hell and tries the song on that instead, with a brand new odd audio effect they had just discovered to add to Tom's voice. The new toys produces a fresh alien sound, and the results perk up everyone in the Radiohead camp. The song would eventually be titled Everything in Its Right Place, 
and it was the breakthrough that got the band out of their funk and inspired to write another album, an album that would guide the new direction in Radiohead's career, titled Kid A. What's the key to a musician's staying power and longevity? Is it raw talent? Good looks? Unconditional love from a legion of adoring fans? Sure, all three of those traits can go hand-in-hand with luck to prevent a flame from burning out too early, but true staying power, and not just music but creativity as a whole, comes as a result of reinvention. It's an art, something many artists try and fail at. Tom York knew Radiohead's legacy didn't lie as a flash-in-the-pan Brit-pop guitar band that was destined to sing creep in every remaining encore of their career. He could feel that longing for reinvention, for something new to fulfill him, and give him a reason to carry on the band. He just needed a push in the right direction. But it goes to show how hard reinvention can be. Being interesting is hard work. It's the constant pressure that can eat at musicians, feeling the need to reinvent themselves lest their fans lose interest and move on to the next flavor of the week, but not so crazy that it makes their existing audience uncomfortable. Not everyone can be Taylor Swift country to pop or the Beatles pop to psychedelic, but it's that endless list of failed reinventions that makes the successful ones so special. And that's what makes the king of reinvention so extraordinary amongst a group of extraordinary people. David Bowie elevated reinvention into an art form, the ultimate chameleon and shapeshifter. He didn't simply change musical direction or update his haircut. He took on entirely new identities. And the genius of it was, with every new identity and the success that came, it was a quick turnaround to something new. He never gave in to the temptation of sucking every dollar he could out of each character, and although they were often eccentric, with the striking fashion changes garnering up a lot of the media attention, make no mistake about it, it was always about the music. After birthing Ziggy Stardust, Aladdin Sane, The Thin White Duke, and other experiments that brought him both great commercial and critical success in the 70s, the page had turned to the 80s. The MTV era was in its infancy, and it was time for Bowie to undergo his most ambitious and risky reinvention to date, leaving his avant-garde art pop behind and taking off all his previous masks to become a true pop star. This is the story of 1983's Let's Dance. The stories behind some of the most famous albums in music history. It's Beyond the Beat with Jared Lennon. You know that feeling when you're a tourist in a new city? How everything feels so new in a foreign land? How rich all the tiny details are? How dense the memories? You can look at a day and marvel at how much you packed in while a routine day back home feels like hardly any time at all. It's the odd way attention works on our brains, how being faced with something unfamiliar and out of your control, maybe a little dangerous, makes you alert. It's exciting, it gets the adrenaline flowing, time slows down, and ignites the creative juices. Musician Brian Eno understood deeply that the enemy of creative work is boredom, and that the artist's friend is alertness. Eno first came on the scene playing synths for English glam rock band Roxy Music in the early 1970s, but rose to prominence with his solo albums and pioneering work in ambient music. A self-described non-musician, Eno helped introduce unique conceptual approaches and recording techniques to contemporary music. When Pitchfork released their list of the top 100 albums of the 70s, Eno had his hand in more than a quarter of them. David Bowie was a huge fan of Eno's 1975 minimalist album, Discreet Music, and was drawn to his unique music philosophy. In 1976, David snatched Eno, along with producer Tony Visconti, to guide him through a new transitionary period in Berlin. David was struggling with an intense cocaine addiction to the point where he couldn't recall any memory from recording his Station to Station album. David was living in Los Angeles, and both his physical and mental state were deteriorating to the point where he's questioning his own sanity. David made the drastic move to Berlin to try to get away from his demons, and with the help of Brian Eno and Tony Visconti, dove into his music. Eno took to showing up at the Hansa studio in the shadow of the Berlin Wall with a black box containing a series of cards he called Oblique Strategies. They're simple cards, small black text on a white background, curved corners, they're about the size of playing cards, although there are about a hundred of them. 
Each card has a different instruction, and you never know which one you're going to get. Eno instructed David to pick one, and if you don't like it, tough luck. Whenever the studio sessions were hitting a lull, Eno would draw a card at random and relay its strange orders. Be the first not to do whatever has not been done before. Or look at the order in which you do things, emphasize the flaws. Or change instrument rows. Sure enough, during the recording of David's Lodger album, Curtis Alomar, one of the world's greatest guitarists, was told to play the drums instead. One musician described the experience as a freight train going through their mind. Someone described the cards as if you're asking the blood in your brain to flow in another direction. It doesn't sound fun, yet the strange, chaotic working process produced some of the decade's most critically acclaimed albums. David would work with Eno on Low, Heroes, and Lodger, rounding out David's Berlin trilogy. You can't argue with the results. Eno understood that obstacles are helpful, and it resonated with David. Something unfamiliar makes you think harder and keeps you more alert. It's not a hindrance, but a secret weapon. If you look back at David's career, he epitomizes the artist not resting on his laurels and getting too comfortable with his own success. By the end of dominating the decade that was the 70s, David was only 33 years old with 14 albums in his belt. He had been Ziggy Stardust, Halloween Jack, The Thin White Duke, Pierrot the Sad Clown, among many other personas. So by late 1982, it was time for a new change. Producer Tony Visconti had worked with Bowie as early as a self-titled 1969 album that produced Space Oddity. He'd end up doing Young Americans, Bowie's whole Berlin trilogy, and his latest, the critically acclaimed Scary Monsters Super Creeps record in 1980. Nothing was wrong with their partnership, except maybe they had gotten too comfortable together. Drawing inspiration from Eno, David wanted to get out of his comfort zone again when thinking up plans for his next record. He talked about it in an interview just ahead of the release of Let's Dance, saying, quote, Because I wanted to redefine everything I did, I think I also wanted to be in a position where I didn't know the people that I was working with, to redevelop the kind of enthusiasm and slight panic that you have when you're not sure what the other person is going to react to in any situation. He'd continue on, saying, quote, You kind of get to a position as a musician where if you have an idea and you know your musicians that you're working with too well, you can almost predict the way they're going to interpret something. And for me personally, that takes some of the fascination of making music away. I like to kind of be surprised each time. In late 1982, David was two years out of what most people would call the normal cycle of a musician. The regular routine of recording an album, releasing it, then touring to promote it. Rinse and repeat. But David had other aspirations following the Scary Monsters record. David didn't go on tour upon its release, but instead turned his focus to his acting career. He'd go on to play the lead role in the Broadway play The Elephant Man for about six months, fully engrossing himself in something he had only dipped his toes into in the past. Because of the gig, he needed to base himself in New York. When he wasn't working, he'd regularly venture out to musicians' haunts like the Continental Nightclub in Manhattan. And it was there one night where a light bulb went off in David's head on the direction he could take his next album. Niall Rogers, who had been phenomenally successful with his group Chic, was there that night. Chic had been on the cutting edge of New York's club scene in the late 70s with massive international hits like La Freak and Good Times. Niall's writing and production work for other artists had spawned dance classics like Sister Sledge's We Are Family and Diana Ross's Upside Down. Rogers, who was putting the finishing touches on his solo debut, was at the nightclub that night with a friend, a mostly still unknown Billy Idol, who was a little worse for wear. In the drafty VIP section, Billy saw David first, quickly telling Niall, Hey, there's David Bowie, soon followed by Idol vomiting everywhere. Niall was shocked, not by Idol's vomit, but instead by Bowie's look. He was expecting the half-alien Ziggy Stardust, not this polished, short-haired, handsome suit-wearing Bowie. It was the early 80s, and everyone was wearing shoulder pads. Dodging Idol's spew, Rogers escaped from the table and sat with Bowie, who was all by himself in a corner of the room. Niall and David hit it off on a connection with old R&B from the 50s, they talked endlessly about music and found they both had the same artists as strong influences. In Rogers, Bowie saw a proven hit maker and also a hidden classicist, someone who had kept black popular music traditions alive within a contemporary sound. A few days later, he asked Nile to produce his next album with a simple direction, make hits. Nile was taken aback, assuming David Bowie always did art first, 
And then if it happened to become a hit, so be it. In hindsight, David's collaboration with Nile Rodgers looked like a surefire winner, but at the time it was anything but. Rodgers' red-hot winning streak with Sheik, Sister Sledge, and Diana Ross was now a couple of years old, and since then his magic touch had deserted him. Nile would later say, quote, To this day, I owe David for his commitment, because at the time I had five flops in a row. I mean it, five. It was really tough for me. Rogers was probably the most experienced producer David had ever teamed up with, but the way he worked with David was unlike anything he'd done before or since. For Bowie, it marked the summit of a working method he'd established many years in the studio, where he delegated key tasks, giving his collaborators huge freedom. Rogers was responsible for recruiting key musicians. Tony Visconti would not be the only casualty of Bowie's purge of his inner comfort circle. He wanted a whole new band. Nile would also be responsible for overseeing the finest details of the musical arrangements. It was Nile Rodgers who programmed the music, but it was David Bowie who programmed Nile Rodgers. The process began at David's house in Lausanne, Switzerland, where they spent days getting to know each other. Bowie programmed his direction by peering over old 50s R&B classics with Nile, the Isley Brothers, Little Richard, etc., all the stuff that made Bowie want to make music in the first place. Non-uptight music coming from a sense of pleasure and happiness. Pointing to a picture of Little Richard exiting out of a red Corvette, Niall Darling, I want the album to sound like this. One morning, David walked into Niall's room with a 12-string guitar, or what had once been a 12-string. It had six strings on it, and David played him a dark-sounding two-chord riff, telling him it was going to be a hit. Niall was confused. First off, why not just use a six-string guitar in the first place? Secondly, the song was folky. David played it vaguely in the style of the birds, and he already had a title which totally caught Niall by surprise. It was to be called Let's Dance. Niall would later say, quote, I was like, that's not happening, man. It totally threw me. I came from dance music, and it was not a song you could dance to. It was so ridiculous to Rogers, he thought he might be getting played. He phoned a mutual friend in New York, asking if David would be the kind of guy to play tricks on him, mind games, if maybe he had ulterior motives. But the friend replied, saying no. If he says it will be a hit, he really believes it. So Niall sat on the song and played around with it, understanding the freedom David was giving him as producer. But it was no easy task. As Niall would later say, quote, Let's Dance is not what I'd call a traditional dance record, but it's certainly a record that does make you want to dance. I thought to myself, man, if I don't make a record that makes people want to dance, and we call the song Let's Dance, I'm going to have to trade in my black union card. Nile would eventually employ his trademark funk guitar as framework for the song, moving the song higher in the scale compared to David's original riff, switching the key, inverting the chords, and adding upstrokes. He knew he needed to make the song more danceable, but he was well aware it couldn't be a disco song. In 1982, the Disco Sucks movement was still fresh in Niall's mind, especially with his band Chic at the forefront. He didn't want Let's Dance under the disco label, hampering its success. So he played simple quick guitar parts later to be treated with delay and echo, as opposed to a constant dancey chunk rhythm. It was unique and weird sounding, but the simple driving bass line rounded it out. Rogers would later say, quote, That riff seemed to me so anti-groove, but sticking it on something that was so hard groove, it was like, shit, this is magic. And I realized that all that 50s and 60s stuff was a snapshot of Bowie's brain. Then I was like, wow, you can do that. Rogers knew that if this was to be a dance hit, it needed funking up. No problem, this was his forte. But all his previous hits had a memorable opening too. The solution came from part of Bowie's quote-unquote programming sessions they had together going over old 50s R&B records. One of the many long talks they had was comparing the two famous versions of the song Twist and Shout, discussing the difference between the Beatles' sweat-drenched version and the Isley Brothers' original. They took particular notice how those teenagers in the 60s went crazy over the vocal stacking effect in the Beatles' version, the one where each member does the ahs over top of each other. As Niall struggled to find a memorable opening for Let's Dance, he thought, what could be a more memorable part than that? It begins in hysteria. A mass of singers urge each other upward, moving in thirds, pursued by a brittle-sounding guitar. The drums, bass, and horns convulse in eighth notes. It's a collective explosion. It's the climax of the Beatles' twist and shout. And for Let's Dance, it's just the intro. 
For the verse, Niall noticed there was a distinct space that needed something after each vocal. It was like it needed some kind of response. The solution was Harry Mancini's Peter Gunn horn riff, dropped in directly after David sings the words, Dance the Blues. It was taken straight from that record like an early version of sampling, a technique Rogers had never employed before. The lyrics for the song reflect Bowie's intention for the whole Let's Dance album, and that was to make pop hits. There's nothing too deep lyrically, but it was never supposed to be. It follows the reliable pop script of getting a hit by calling people out to dance. Yet for some reason, it doesn't lose any of the great Bowie weirdness. The first verse opening with, Let's dance, put on your red shoes, and dance the blues. Let's dance to the song they're playing on the radio. Let's sway while color lights up your face. Let's sway, sway through the crowd to an empty space. The chorus reflects a simple message of someone in love. If you say run, I'll run with you. And if you say hide, we'll hide. Because my love for you would break my heart in two if you should fall into my arms and tremble like a flower. If you look past the pop shine Rogers devised for it, Let's Dance can seem fragile, prematurely regretful. The singer hopes that the dance he's asking for, the moment that he's devising, will cause his lover to finally commit to him, to give him the life he's always wanted. But he fears that even if his plan works, it will only be for a moment. The last line of the second verse, Let's sway under the moonlight, this serious moonlight, would lead Bowie to call his follow-up tour the Serious Moonlight Tour, up until that point Bowie's longest and most successful tour. One of the trademarks of Let's Dance is the crushing drum beat and the very 80s sounding snare drum driving it forward. Power Station, the New York studio where the album would be recorded, had developed its trademark sound from its gated snare drum. Engineers were always trying to better record the snap of a snare drum being hit. The classic sound was developed concurrently in 1980 at the Power Station and at London's Townhouse Studios on Peter Gabriel's third album. Phil Collins was there at the time and would make the drum sound famous in 1981 on his hit In the Air Tonight. Many years later, Niall reflected on the memory of the framework of Let's Dance coming together and how it shaped the rest of the records. And quote, this demo recording was the first indication of what we could do together as I took his folk song and arranged it into something that the entire world would soon be dancing to and seemingly has not stopped dancing to for the last 35 years. It became the blueprint not only for Let's Dance, the song, but for the entire album as well. There was two main versions released of the song. The seven minutes plus version on the album is expansive and becomes a series of set pieces as if a DJ is shuffling through dance instruction records. The single edit is remorseless, all economy, and punch. The single would eventually become Bowie's biggest of his career. It entered the UK singles chart at number 5 on its first week of release and stayed at the top of the charts for three weeks. Soon afterwards, the single topped the Billboard Hot 100, becoming Bowie's first and only single to top the charts in both the US and the UK. It was also his second and last single to reach number 1 in the US. It made him at last the colossal celebrity that he had always intended and had always pretended to be. Let's Dance was also coronation music for Bowie's latest incarnation, the hipster CEO figure, seen on stage throughout 1983 and starring in Let's Dance's run of hit videos. The blonde hair, the jaw made out of steel, the designer suits with the dangling unknotted neckties, the golf gloves, the modest dancing. As one writer claimed, it was Bowie as an avatar of pure fame, becoming an international trademark of his own music, like the Apple logo or the Nike Swish, the man who sold himself to the world, which bought him. One of the most memorable parts of Let's Dance comes from the bluesy guitar solo. Much like he had done by producing Lou Reed and Iggy Pop earlier in the 70s, Bowie brought an unknown musician to the forefront by the name of Stevie Ray Vaughan. It was earlier that year in July where David was attending the Montreux Jazz Festival as a fan where he'd encountered the guitarist. It was a big show for Stevie and his band Double Trouble as they had yet to release their debut and were struggling to get any mainstream attention at the time. The unsigned outfit received boos and catcalls from an audience expecting cool quiet jazz, but the blues trio were so fired up by the first overseas show that they later carried their amplifiers downstairs to the bar where they jammed until dawn. As the sun came up, they noticed a figure drinking at the counter. They knew it must be David Bowie. The band wasn't starstruck, though. They hardly knew his music, but were impressed by his charm, the way he'd stayed up until dawn to talk to them, and how he handled himself. 
David sat with him for a while, speaking mostly to Stevie, talking about guitar playing. But it was just left as that. Bowie and Stevie and his band went their separate ways with nothing but a cool memory in tow. But Bowie couldn't get Stevie's guitar playing out of his head. Bowie would later talk about that memory, saying, quote, He was like second on the bill or something, and this little kid from Austin, Texas came out and just played some of the most devastating city rhythm and blues I've heard in years. Saying in a different interview, quote, He completely floored me. I probably hadn't been so gung-ho about a guitar player since seeing Jeff Beck with his pre-Yardbirds band, The Tridents. Four months later, as Bowie prepared to hit the studio, he ran it by Niall what he thought about bringing in Stevie to do the lead guitar on the album. Rogers was unimpressed, though, by the suggestion, telling him the guitarist was just recycling Albert King's old blues style. This guy's different, David told him. He's got a whole other thing going on. Niall would eventually be convinced, and David would track Stevie down to offer him the gig. Vaughn accepted, confident in his studio playing and guitar chops, that he could keep up with the seasoned studio professionals and one of the biggest rock stars in the world. Vaughn showed up within a day or two, his modesty impressing most of the studio brass by his lack of gear. He didn't enter in with some intricate guitar pedal board that most guitarists of his caliber would be expected to. He just brought his Fender Stratocaster guitar and an old Fender amp, and he was good to go. No pretension. All the tone coming from the player with no tricks. One of the first tracks to be worked on was Let's Dance. Niall would later look back on the memory of witnessing a young blues-influenced Stevie enter this studio to play on this pop dance record, saying, quote, I only wish we had cell phones in those days so I could have captured the look on Stevie's face when he first heard the track. He knew it was so important that the first thing he played was one single note, a B-flat, to stay out of the way of the groove. He then ripped as he got more comfortable with the band and everyone in the room. Niall would later say that Stevie added his guitar parts instantaneously. Vaughn would later describe his time there with, quote, Bowie is real easy to work with. He knows what he's doing in the studio and he doesn't mess around. He'd give his opinion on the stuff he liked and the stuff that needed work. Almost everything was cut in one or two takes. I think there was only one thing that needed three takes. Upon hearing Let's Dance for the first time, Eric clapped and said, quote, I stopped my car and said, I have to know who this guitar player is today, not tomorrow, but today. Ultimately, Vaughn played on six of the album's eight songs, including two of the mega hits, Let's Dance and China Girl. Bowie was extremely impressed how Stevie was able to connect to such an old, well-established genre of blues guitar playing with songs that sounded so foreign to him saying, quote, In a ridiculously short time, he'd become midwife to a sound that I had ringing in my ears all year, a dance form that had its melody rooted in a European sensibility, but owed its impact to the blues. Let's Dance was to be Vaughn's big break, and with his group Double Trouble, he was signed to a record label soon after Let's Dance's success. Let's Dance and China Girl get most of the attention with Stevie's contribution, but guitar-wise, the song that truly kicks collective ass is the less famous Cat People putting out the fire. It's also got the album's healthiest serving of SRV. He solos in the middle, adds Albert King's style bends throughout, and then solos near the end of the song. Cat People was unique in that it was a previously written Bowie song, intended as the theme for the 1982 remake of the classic horror film of the same name. It came at a time when Bowie was less focused on music and more spending on time with his son Zoe at their home in Switzerland. The director for Cat People, Paul Schrader, pitched the song to Bowie after Italian composer Giorgio Marauder had already written most of the music. It would be one of only a couple musical ventures for Bowie during the summer of 1981, after more than a decade of mostly straight recording and touring. It's safe to say he was due for some well-needed rest. David Robert Jones was born January 8, 1947, in Brixton, London, England. He showed musical interest at a young age. When he was nine, his father brought home a collection of American 45s by artists including the Teenagers, The Platters, Fats Domino, Elvis Presley, and Little Richard. Upon listening to Little Richard's Tutti Frutti, Bowie would later say that he had heard God. He was infatuated with 50s rock and roll and R&B. In 1962, David got into a fight with a friend over a girl. David was punched in the left eye, requiring a four-month stay in a hospital and a series of operations just to save the eye. The damage wasn't fully repaired, leaving him with a faulty depth perception and a permanently dilated pupil. It would be one of David's most recognizable features throughout his career. 
Bowie's maternal half-brother, Terry, was a big influence on his early life. He was 10 years older and suffered from schizophrenia and seizures, living in and out of home and psychiatric wards. But he would introduce Bowie to many of his lifelong influences, including jazz, Buddhism, beat poetry, and the occult. Terry would also provide inspiration for a later character of Bowie's, A Lad Insane, based on the pun, A Lad Insane. As a kid, David studied art, music, and design before he really started to focus on a music career around 1963. He started by joining several blues bands, but went his own way after they all had little success. Dissatisfied with his name and being confused with Davy Jones of the Monkees, David's first transformation of his music career came as tribute to American pioneer James Bowie. David Jones became David Bowie in 1967, followed by the release of his self-titled debut album. It was a disappointment, failing to chart, and would lead to no other releases for the next two years. But in 1969, a coincidence led to Bowie's big break. His single, Space Oddity, inspired by the film 2001 A Space Odyssey, would be released five days before the Apollo moon landing. The track became a hit, but a sophomore effort of the same name was still a commercial disappointment. To promote his third album, The Man Who Sold the World, Bowie was put in a dress on the cover to capitalize on his androgynous look. In 1971, Hunky Dory was released as a pop-influenced record featuring the song Changes. It was soon followed by the creation of the persona Ziggy Stardust and his backing band The Spiders from Mars, along with a unique stage show. Likely what most people think of when they think of Bowie, the pansexual alien rock star character broke Bowie into the mainstream, accompanied with his smash record, The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, already his fifth album by this time. With a distinctive red mullet hairstyle and tight jumpsuit, Bowie broke through to the mass public on the summer of 1972, performing the song Starman on the British chart show Top of the Pops. A song from the perspective of a kid listening to the radio and hearing about this alien, Ziggy Stardust, bringing a message of hope to Earth's youth. Starman follows the album's storyline of Ziggy being sent to her planet as a savior before an impending apocalyptic disaster. Half influenced by sci-fi and half out of the Japanese theater, the look alone was simply outrageous for the time. Widely considered the birth of glam rock, Bowie shocked everyone by suddenly retiring the character at its commercial peak July 3rd, 1973. But we would spend the rest of the 70s in and out of commercial success. In 1975, Bowie's style shifted towards a sound he characterized as Plastic Soul, initially alienating many of his UK fans, but garnering him his first major US crossover success with the single Fame and the album Young Americans. It was around then that Bowie moved to Los Angeles and brought us the darkest of all his alter egos, the Thin White Duke. It came at the peak of Bowie's cocaine addiction, largely isolating himself, obsessed with the occult, and consuming a daily diet of red peppers, milk, and, well, cocaine. Although Bowie claimed he recalled almost nothing of the year 1975, including recording Station to Station, the album that combined influences of European electronic music and American R&B, is regarded as some of his best work. Bowie eventually shed his thin white Duke identity, leaving Los Angeles for Berlin to improve his mental and physical well-being. That's where the partnership with Brian Eno was born, and what came next was the Berlin Trilogy, the albums Low, Heroes, and Lodger. Drawn in by a new style of electronic music, namely Kraftwerk, it's looked upon today by many as being his most musically innovative and influential, who says you need to be in a constant drug haze in order to be creative. David would look back at this period with exuberance, saying it was a measuring stick for any new music he later put out. By 1980, the musical and subcultural seeds that Bowie had planted were in full bloom, with traces of his influence being found in punk, post-punk, and particularly in the new romantic movements in Britain. But it was a theatrical movement stemming as far back as the 17th century, where Bowie would now borrow from, with Piro the Sad Clown. It provided a striking image for the iconic Ashes to Ashes video off of Scary Monsters' Super Creeps, an album one critic called The Perfect Balance of Creativity and Mainstream Success. It was Piero the Sad Clown that Bowie presented for a new generation, showing the new romantics how dark existential tones was done. Scary Monsters was a commercial success for Bowie, but it failed to lead to any major international hits. Ashes to Ashes was big in the UK, but failed to make a dent in the US, and it left a sour taste in Bowie's mouth. The plan for 1981 was to tour, burning through the Berlin records and scary monsters and reviving standards. But the murder of a friend of Bowie's heeded any chance of that. 
Bowie was acting on Broadway when John Lennon was shot December 8, 1980. Apparently, a flyer for Bowie's play was found at the home of Lennon's killer, Mark David Chapman, with Bowie's name circled. Not only was a good friend of his murdered, but the potential dark possibilities of fan and star interaction was a deep wake-up call. Bowie fled New York in the new year, and he moved to his residence in Switzerland to get some semblance of a normal life for his kid. And after focusing on his acting and his family life for the first time in a while, it's then when he got the opportunity to dip his toes back into music with Cat People. The song was Bowie's first and only collaboration with Giorgio Marauder, the Italian electro pioneer best known for his chattering sequencers of songs like Donna Summer's I Feel Love. But for this song, he constructed a bleak, minimalistic soundscape based on the simplest of two chord changes. Bowie recorded his hypnotic, deep baritone vocal over Marauder's backing track at Mountain Studios in Switzerland. Bowie's performance seems like a near parody of Jim Morrison at times. The opening minutes would count among the most restrained of his career. The single became Bowie's biggest solo hit in America since Golden Years, six years previously in 1976. Bowie'd by its success, Bowie re-recorded the song for the Let's Dance album. The updated version is quite a bit different, though. The second verse was cut, and overall the sound is much more dated and fits with the 80s pop sound of Let's Dance. The original is much stronger and more atmospheric. Quentin Tarantino would eventually unearth the original track for his Nazi splatter movie, Inglorious Bastards, in 2009. Tarantino saying he was disappointed how a great song like that was used in the movie it was originally made for, saying, quote, Man, if we had a song like that written for our movie, we'd build a 20-minute sequence around it. So I did. It was during Bowie's visits to Mountain Studios in Montreux, Switzerland, to work on Cat People, that David reacquainted himself with a fan-turned-rival who was recording in a different room. David had met Freddie Mercury back in the summer of 1970, when the Queen singer, working on a stall in Kensington Market, fitted Bowie with a pair of suede boots. Introduced by a mutual friend, Freddie had shyly mentioned he was rehearsing with a new band. David, then disenchanted, replied, Why would you want to get into this business? Fortunately, Freddie had ignored him. By chance, Queen was working at Mountain Studios the same time as Bowie. Queen was recording their R&B-flavored album, Hot Space, and asked Bowie to add backing vocals on the song Cool Cat. What was to be a quick vocal session turned into a marathon, in which the Queen song Feel Like was transformed into the track Under Pressure. David contributed the bulk of the lyrics set over drummer Roger Taylor's descending chord sequence. David mostly worked with the Queen drummer who was at the heart of the session, although the lyrics and the title idea came from Freddie and David. Queen guitarist Brian May would later mention that David was charming, polite, and sensitive in his dealings with these four relative strangers, but also remarkably confident. May said, quote, David took over the song lyrically, encouraging Freddie and contributing the classic swooping melody. When the backing track was done, David said, Okay, let's each of us go in the vocal booth and sing how we think the melody should go, just off the top of our heads, and we'll compile a vocal out of that. And that's what we did. Some of these improvisations, including Mercury's memorable introductory scatting vocal, would endure on the finished track. David also contributed one of the most distinctive and memorable middle eight sections in rock history with the lyrics, The Terror of Knowing What This World Is All About. Under Pressure was released as a single later that year and then included on Queen's 1982 Hot Space album. It was a huge hit, becoming Bowie's third number one in the UK of his career. Maybe it gave David a bit of confidence to go into a more pop-oriented space with his next release. It certainly didn't sound anything off of Scary Monsters. It was a satisfying coup for Bowie, helping craft another hit from behind the scenes, as he had done for many others, all the more so given his sudden disappearance from the music scene as well. He was also happy to relinquish under pressure to Queen, giving them the mechanical royalties due to a horrible contractual obligation he was stuck in with his former manager. Bowie learned about the music business the hard way from a notoriously bad contract with early manager Tony DeFries. They parted ways in 1975 in a deal that gave DeFries, who paved the way for Bowie's rise to superstardom, a share of some of the singer's income for the following seven years. DeFries helped negotiate Bowie's deal with his record company RCA so that the two of them owned the recording copyrights, something almost unheard of at the time. But Bowie had to split the share 50-50 with DeFries, which he'd come to resent. 
For example, when Bowie would go on tour, he'd have to pay all the expenses, but only after giving DeFries his 50% off the top. In 1975, Bowie, RCA, and DeFries came to an agreement to terminate DeFries as manager, but where he'd retain his 50-50 share for all of Bowie's music released until 1982. Bowie in the end reluctantly agreed to it, but later said it was the worst decision of my life. Years later, Bowie would have to buy DeFries out to secure his full royalties. But as of September 30th, 1982, David would assume full rights to his new songs. Having bided his time, Bowie told one reporter that he was preparing for his next album and had a tentative title already planned, inspired by DeFries, Vampires and Human Flesh. That time period was extra significant for Bowie on the business side of his career because his record contract with RCA had expired. He'd grown dissatisfied with RCA, feeling they weren't flexing their promotion muscle on his new releases, and instead were focusing on milking his back catalog with re-releases. In late 1982, an unofficial bidding war to sign Bowie began between a number of labels. EMI had taken a liking to him after his collaboration with one of their bands in Queen. Freddie Mercury reportedly talked highly of the record label as well, finally leading to Bowie deciding on them. On January 27th, a few months before Bowie would release Let's Dance, he signed a five-year contract with EMI for an undisclosed sum reported to be between $10 and $20 million. Apparently, EMI was persuaded to hand over such a large sum on the basis of hearing the backing tracks for the upcoming album. It was a superstar deal when Bowie's record sales at the time probably weren't warranting it. It was a big risk for EMI, but eventually would pay off in dividends. He was optimistic about the new freedom EMI gave him. It gave him a new zest for music. It gave him the motivation to record Let's Dance and put out another album, and that's why it was an interesting choice for Bowie to look back and cover some of his own songs, including Cat People, and also one written for a good friend of his, Iggy Pop. Bowie had written the song China Girl for Iggy's 1977 album, The Idiot. The original was a charming but raw guitar-charged ballad, and ultimately failed to make any dent on the charts. But Bowie didn't forget it, and was insistent that it had real potential. He kept telling Niall it was a hit in the making, if only they could come up with a better hook. They had just finished recording the song Let's Dance at the studio, when Niall went to work. Rogers went literal, playing off the word China, to come up with the riff which he knew bordered on parody. Niall would later say, quote, David was either going to hate this so much he would fire me, or he was going to get the comedic value of writing this silly little poppy thing. Niall had adopted the opening riff from Rufus's Sweet Thing to give it a Chinese feel. He was nervous when he played Bowie the riff, but David loved it straight away. With this riff and a much smoother production, the song sounded little like Iggy Pop's original version. Originally, Niall offered his own interpretation of what the lyrics meant, saying, quote, I figured China Girl was about doing drugs because China is China White, which is heroin. Girl is cocaine. I thought it was a song about speedballing. I thought in the drug community in New York, coke is a girl and heroin is boy. So then I proceeded to do this arrangement, which is ultra pop, because I thought that being David Bowie, he would appreciate the irony of doing something so pop about doing something so taboo. And what was really cool was that he said, I love that. Back in 1976, it all began when Iggy Pop and David Bowie were drunk one summer night. They were at the Chateau de Harroville, a reportedly haunted castle in a small town outside of Paris, France. They were busy making Pop's record when Iggy sat down behind a child's drum kit and Bowie at a toy piano. They started playing, hit upon a groove, got it on tape, and they called the piece, barely a riff, Borderline. Iggy was having an affair at the time with another guest at the castle, Kulin Guin. Guin was of Vietnamese descent and only spoke French as a second language. She spoke no English, pop, no French. So the two communicated in gestures, expressions, and pidgin reductions of each other's language. Pop spent days working out the vocal, eventually improvising much of the final lyric while standing at the mic. He was working in a pop tradition, a song with language as an obstacle hindering lovers like the Beatles' Michelle or Chuck Berry's Lawanda. Yet in China Girl, broken communication is besides the point. It's what happens when the two manage to connect. Pop was using outdated stereotypes bordering on racism, casting Guin as the mysterious sensual orient and himself, Jimmy, as an unwilling agent of the corrupt West. But the song is satire, using racism to fight racism. 
Iggy and later Bowie, assuming the persona of the stereotypical Western oppressor in Asia, imposing Western norms with little concern for the consequences. The first few verses reflect the man's love of this foreign woman, saying he's a wreck without his little China girl. But in the bridge is where it becomes obvious he's playing a character, talking about the stereotypical feeling of superiority Westerners have in Asian countries, with, My little China girl, you shouldn't mess with me. I'll ruin everything you are. You know, I'll give you television. I'll give you eyes of blue. I'll give you a man who wants to rule the world. Eyes of Blue, of course, marking illegitimate children as outsiders for years after various wars in Asia, especially the Vietnam War, where American servicemen took advantage of the local population. The line, I'll ruin everything you are, signaling that the character is self-aware of his bad influence, yet he can't help it because he loves the woman, and it's not so clear what he's ruining. Of course, China Girl for most of the world is now a David Bowie song. The popularity of Bowie's version has made the original sounding like a bizarre sequel. Bowie cut China Girl in part to help Iggy, who was broke and barely recording in the early 80s. But it wasn't just altruism. Bowie frequently recycled his previous collaborations with Iggy, and his increased use of covers in general suggested maybe a decline in the pace and quality of Bowie's songwriting in the 80s. For China Girl, it was the music video that helped make it such a hit, eventually peaking at number 10 on Billboard's Hot 100 chart and beating Michael Jackson's Thriller for Best Male Video at the very first MTV Music Video Awards in 1984. Bowie would later talk about using the video as a platform with a message about racism, saying, quote, What I wanted to present was the idea of the imperialist Westerner coming to a foreign society and sort of dazzling the indigenous peoples with the idea of their Western way of life, and that it's not necessarily a good thing to be jumping for it. At the time, the China Girl video was a marvel. It depicted the previously thought of gender-bending Bowie as a hyper-masculine protagonist in a lush interracial romance. It's almost impossible to avoid Bowie's deliberate use of stereotypes, from Nile Rodgers' Chinese guitar riff that opens the song, to the way Bowie mocks how the girl says mouth, to the high-end video where Bowie pats the head of his pajama-clad Chinese girl. Bowie courts her by slanting his eyes, and it culminates in a scene shot in Sydney's Chinatown district where Bowie hurls a bowl of rice into the air. Could an artist get away with that now? Would an artist have the guts to tackle racism with the direct use of satire? Today's cancel culture likely makes that impossible. But it's also important to remember the context of which Bowie released the China Girl video. Bowie had cast Aboriginal and white Australians in the Let's Dance music video a few months prior to critique racism in Australia. The iconic video used the Red Shoes lyric to serve as a corrupting symbol of modern capitalism. The Let's Dance video is best remembered for a few random images, an Aboriginal boy dragging a machine down a Sydney street, the boy and his girlfriend painting a snake on the wall of an art gallery, an immaculate Bowie playing his song in an outback bar. Bowie was ahead of the curve in trying to do some good in the world with these videos, as he explained in an interview at the time, saying, quote, Both videos, of course, were about racism and oppression. Very simple, very direct. They're almost like Russian social realism. Very naive. And the message that they have is very simple. It's wrong to be racist. But I see no reason to fuck about with that message, you see? I thought, let's try use the video format as a platform for some kind of social observation and not just wasted on trotting out and trying to enhance the public image of the singer involved. I mean, these are little movies, and some movies can have a point. So why not try to make some point? This stuff goes out all over the world. It's played on all kinds of programs. I mean, you get free point time. While Bowie focused on using the videos for Let's Dance and China Girl on an important message of social justice, the third single off of Let's Dance was more in the vein of what Bowie said he was trying not to do with the other videos. Modern Love comes tearing out of the gate as the opening track to the Let's Dance album. The video captured what looks like Bowie and his band re-emerging from an encore during a four-night stand in Philadelphia. It's as straightforward as a music video can get, showing off Bowie's new look and not hiding from his pop sensibility. The punchy high-energy rocker sets the tone for his new sound, a tribute to his 50s rock and roll influences. Bowie said Modern Love's call and response vocal arrangement all comes from, quote, Little Richard. The rock and roll kickbeat and soul inspired vocal harmonies take from retired genres of the past, and the piano, though it's sunk in the mix, is indebted to both Little Richard and Johnny Johnson, Chuck Berry's pianist. That sound was deliberate not only on Modern Love, 
but let's dance as a record. I mentioned David sort of programming his vision into Niall's brain as they sat around and listened to old 50s records for days on end before they hit the studio. David was set on reinventing his sound to be more quote-unquote warm. As the 70s went on, he found himself developing this strange, new, wavy, more electronic type music. It was bold and inventive, and Bowie was praised for it, but maybe feeling nostalgic, he still longed for that feeling he got when listening to straightforward rock and roll as he did as a kid. He explained it in an interview at the time, saying, quote, I was sort of disappointed with the way synthesizers have bullied music into a kind of cold place. So much of the music that's being made at the moment is very earnest. It doesn't have that quality of necessity that music used to have. It's become style over content. So in a natural progression, I just went back to the kinds of music that really excited me when I started. I was listening to people like Buddy Guy, Red Price Sock, Alan Freed, Big Bands. Stuff like that has such a dynamic, enthusiastic quality. It's the enthusiasm that I actually was looking for. After his Scary Monsters album was released, the New Romantic movement kind of went mainstream. Bowie lost touch with what it became, this sort of wallowing in my feelings, all about me generation, as he'd later say. Let's Dance was an attempt at regaining the immediacy and excitement you feel when you listen back to your old records from when you were a kid. As he'd say, quote, You always go back and say those were the good old days. Well, I'm sure there's a way of saying those were the good old days, and this is how you recapture that feeling and put it out and outside of oneself and not just have it laying dormant in there as though this is something that can never happen again. That's a great shame, and I'd like to try and attack that energy. For much of their time together before they hit the studio, Niall and David would talk about 50s album sleeves, flipping through David's collection of vinyl albums, some of them venerable originals that he'd bought 20 years before. They played the records and chatted about Little Richard, the childhood hero whom David still revered. It was like being induced via a series of visual and auditory mood boards. Rogers later said that it was like being offered a snapshot of Bowie's brain at the time. It was Bowie subtly getting Rogers into the state of mind that Bowie required, employing Rogers' contemporary music knowledge with a revisionist's deliberate perspective. It was only later that Rogers realized he was being programmed, brainwashed, in a musical version of The Manjurian Candidate. For many of Bowie's previous records, he had honed the art of briefing musicians, getting them to pull something out of their consciousness that they hadn't known existed. Now he was doing it on a bigger scale. That bright communal joy you hear on a lot of those old 50s records is something that stands out immediately on Modern Love. However, it masks a spiritually empty view of life and love reflected in the lyrics. There's a lot to unpack in the lyrics. It can be quite confusing, but it seems to be Bowie's frustration with the state of, well, modern love. He opens the song with a spoken word part. I know when to go out and when to stay in, get things done. It's like he's trying to reassure himself that he has things under control, but as the song progresses, it's clear he's less decisive. In the second verse, he expresses his frustration that when you're new in the dating scene, you're putting on this facade to get the other person to like you. But likely, it will fail, leaving him back in the metaphorical rain again with, There's no sign of life, it's just the power to charm. I'm lying in the rain. But I never wave bye-bye, but I try. I try. Bowie's apathetic about modern love, but he ends every verse with this feeling of hope he's not going to give up. In the chorus, it's more hopeful again, with him saying he's not going to give in to that cynical take on finding love like so many people fall for. He's desperately holding on to almost a childhood fairy tale version of love he once imagined, with Never going to fall for modern love walks beside me, modern love walks on by, modern love gets me to church on time. Bowie cleverly uses church to mean that his shallow relationships drive him to find answers in religion and God instead of leading to a church wedding. It continues with a different call and response part where Bowie outlines his contradictory feelings on putting his faith in God rather than love. With church on time terrifies me, church on time makes me party, church on time puts my trust in God and man. The final part of the chorus is Bowie outlining more frustration after failing to find meaning in God. He's desperately trying to find meaning somewhere. With God and man, no confessions. God and man, no religion. God and man, don't believe in modern love. It's a bit of an echo of John Lennon's imagined in God. Bowie checking off everything that's failed him. No religion, 
no confessions, no love. And then another verse comes in where he's right back where he started, maybe also referencing how preaching at church is similar to that facade you put up when trying to impress someone on a date. It's just another way to charm with, it's not really work, it's just the power to charm. I'm still standing in the wind. And that continues in the outro, where Bowie's left clinging for some meaning. In the end, he's ultimately left disappointed by modern love and all relationships, be they man and woman or man and God. Yet, he's still holding on to hope. With, modern love walks beside me, modern love walks on by. Never gonna fall for modern love. Bowie's vocal is one of the strongest on the record. He never doubts himself despite what he encounters. He's determined to sell you through it. The song slowly builds where you go through Bowie's disappointment of circling back on the state of modern love. By the end, he's yelling. Everyone on the track is echoing the statement as well, the manic background vocals chanting back whatever words Bowie feeds them, the frantic horns, and the crashing cymbals. Over a classic 50s rock and roll Little Richard-esque sounds, it's like the emptiness Bowie has unveiled has become something worth celebrating. Modern Love was released as the third single off of Let's Dance and was a commercial success. The video helped boost it, peaking at number two on the UK singles chart and number 14 on the US Billboard Hot 100. Bowie was not a fan of vacations and taking time off. Holidays to him are boring. So as the tireless workaholic went away to the South Pacific in 1982 to cure the boredom, he brought along his favorite blues and R&B records from when he was a kid. Little did he know at the time that that vacation would shape his whole sound and direction for most of the 80s. It shaped him deciding on Nile Rodgers as producer, and it shaped the enthusiasm and optimism of Let's Dance as a whole. Let's Dance was cut in 17 days at the New York studio power station. Preceded by the smash hit title single that topped the charts on both sides of the Atlantic, Let's Dance was released on April 14th, 1983 to unprecedented commercial success. In Britain, it entered at number one, and although it spent only three weeks there, a feat surpassed by Aladdin, Sane, Pinups, and Diamond Dogs, it remained on the chart for over a year. Crucially, it was also a US number one. Having largely ignored Bowie since the mid-70s, the American market exploded. Billboard hailed the album as Bowie's most accessible music in years, bracing state-of-the-art urban dance rock, while one critic called it some of the most exciting R&B-based dance music in years. Delighted with its latest investment, EMI declared Let's Dance its fastest-selling album since Sgt. Pepper. Six million copies were sold as the album spawned two more hit singles and trailed the massive Serious Moonlight Tour, which ran from May to December. RCA got in on the act by re-releasing Bowie's back catalog at a budget price, meaning that by July, he had no fewer than 10 albums in the UK Top 100. This feat, unique for a living artist, contributed to Bowie's record for the highest number of individual album weeks on the chart in 1983, a staggering 198. But as his commercial success grew, Bowie's relationship with the album changed over time. Within three years, Bowie had begun distancing himself from it, glad of its success, but admitting that it hemmed him as an artist, saying in an interview, quote, Let's Dance, I think, really was more Niles' album than mine. It was Niles' version of what my music should sound like, and I provided the songs. Niles didn't disagree, saying later in 1998, Bowie spent the entire record sitting on the sofa while I made his record. Then we walked in the studio and he sang. It was the perfect marriage. You get that sort of impression on the lesser-known tracks on Let's Dance, the more forgettable ones. It's clear Niall had his hands all over songs like Without You, Ricochet, and Shake It. Without You sounds like a long-lost Chic track and even features Chic bass player Bernard Edwards. EMI dug into the well a little too deep with Without You, released as the fourth single in November of 83, but failed to make any commercial dent. Ricochet was one of Bowie's favorite tracks on the record, though he later regretted turning over some of its creation to Nile. He'd later say the beat didn't quite flow the way it should have, with the syncopation all wrong. And Shake It is just one of the most forgettable tracks off Let's Dance, almost sounding like Nile was trying to guess what Bowie wanted with it. It toggles the line between parody and a good dance track. The album sent Bowie into the stratosphere as a pop artist. It led to a very successful 96-date tour, but in an attempt to have lightning strike twice with 1984's album Tonight, 
failed, and left Bowie confused over his priorities with his career and the connection he had between his fans. Eventually, he'd get back into his reinventing of sorts in the 90s and reclaim control and satisfaction with his career moving forward. You can look at Let's Dance from the outside and say Bowie was maybe selling out, but it's important to remember the theatrics, gender meltdowns, and fashion experiments of Bowie's career in the 70s had been repackaged for the mainstream with huge success by acts like the Eurythmics, the Human League, Howard Jones, Thompson Twins, and Duran Duran. The club kids who had championed Scary Monsters three years earlier were now topping the charts with their own bands. Stepping outside the norm had become the norm, so it was time for a change again. A change back to the warm, straightforward, optimistic music of his youth. Let's Dance is a record where Bowie reinvented his whole brand. He exchanged all the mystery about him for mass connection. It's Bowie being communal, it's intended to be shared, and it worked. A risky and an ambitious reinvention, considering how he achieved that rare feat of becoming both a commercial and critical success in the avant-garde. Going back to that day in Switzerland when Bowie played his sad, fragile song to Rogers, Bowie knew that Rogers, a brilliant arranger, could make a wallflower ballad into a shining dance anthem. Rogers would reinvent the song and shape its direction. It turned out it's the push that guided Bowie's whole reinvention at that time. Further proof that reinvention is necessary and that you don't grow when you stay as the big fish in the little pond. In the 70s, he'd rebranded himself as the world's first bisexual rock star. Now his niche brand was being relaunched as an international multimedia product. Don't ever become stale and bored in a life you find less than fulfilling. David Bowie didn't, and that's why his star will shine far brighter than most. <laughs> guys thanks for listening if you'd like to keep up to date with everything i got going on with this channel be sure to follow my instagram page also i do have a youtube channel where i condense individual stories from my podcast into short video form so please like and subscribe on there as well thanks again